done. Whereas the real damage is where? And right now, when it gets hit by a truck, you can tell your your people there that you just wrote the violation because you got to show up there. It's a fire escape lottery ticket. Why? Got to repair the whole thing and load test it. So you can spot repair the whole thing, spot repair this, and then load test it. Who pays? It's a truck. Now, are they bound by the five-year load test going forward after that repair? Five years later, they have to load test it again. If they certified it at that time, yeah. five years later, there's no load test because you're choosing other evidence of strength. And that could last 15 to 25 years if you keep maintaining it because the city's going to always ask you, what, what are you providing me as other evidence of strength? Well, 10 years ago, we certified we We refurbished it completely. We didn't just spot repair. We refurbished it. Oh, okay. And they'll accept the, uh, the documents from the, uh, the circle engineer. This is the only way wood is attached, guys with a through bolt inside picking up the, uh, the studs. Three quarter rod or five eighths rod is the thing. If you see half inch or less, it's improper. And the giveaway that you have the wrong attachment is when you see a lot of lag screws. You see six <laughs> lag screws going in a, a, through, into a, a bracket. That's an indicator on a wood structure that it was improperly installed. And a lot of those aluminum fire escapes that you see, it's lag screwed in. Okay. And a lot of fire escape repairs, when they have to put in a bracket of some kind, they lack screwed it in instead of through bolting it. If for some reason you can't get in here and fix this with a through bolt, as soon as you put a leg here, do I need a through bolt? No. So now I can put six screws into the building because I'm going to put a leg here to a through to a to a to a solid tube. <coughs> so Cisco, on that the aluminum one that we spoke about, uh, Lily. Center. What's your method of repair with that? Sure. Well, we discussed that briefly, but um, basically what you have is uh, down in Fall River, New Bedford, there's a lot of those aluminum fire escapes. The railing is uh, basically a bed tube with uh, fasteners that are like the 316s or, or, or 8 screws. So can we fix those? Yeah, you basically have to uh, up everything into the 3 8 in discussions with a city official, start closing up some of the gaps because there's a pre-existing non-conforming structure that you have to deal with. How it ties in, it was tied into the grading, and the grading was handmade, two-inch spacing instead of the one-inch. So you just take that grading, I'll buy a new, uh, new aluminum grading from McNichols because they produce aluminum grading that meets the code, so you just drop the grading. And uh, the angles were inch and a half, uh, that the norm is two by two by four, so as soon as you put two inch and a half aluminums together, back to back, and sister it, I've exceeded the two-inch requirement. So you didn't have to replace the fire escape, but we have to go in and reinforce it. So we're using an engineer drawing, which they haven't done yet as of yet, but the engineer drawing, which when he went back and looked at the case, there was no permit even pulled to do the job. So he had a choice to basically say, get this thing out of here, give me a brand new fire escape, or work with a client and say, hey, if there's a way to salvage this and still meet his requirement. So he basically said if they reinforce it and bring it up to code using an engineer, it's proof back to him that it was done correctly, he'll allow the reinforcement. Otherwise, get it out of here, pull a brand new permit, give me a set of drawings, and put up a new fire escape. So, legs like well, yeah, and you can do legs. So, again, what can we do to basically answer? But, but if it's lag screwed in, we can just go in and put a through bolt. There's a lot of those, as you know, I think we're lag screwed. Yeah, and actually, you can tell, it's usually six or eight lag screws. That's an indication. And the sheet metal screws is a, but again, it was a guy that did aluminum siding. He primarily did a lot of his work down in Fall River, New Bedford, uh, and you know, in that area, southeastern Mass. But occasionally, we've seen a few. This is sometimes some of the few. We haven't actually gotten to, and I'm hoping we will, about uh, when you have the counterbalance to uh, ladders and, and stair systems, what kind yeah. of damage can occur from those. He's a plant, you know, he actually works for me. I'm concerned about what kind of, uh, like wind loads. Would those things, are they subject to wind load where they can start more slow loads? They can catch the weight down and put additional stresses because it's not a regular on a used staircase, but now you have that additional <coughs> weight, uh, dead weight, but live weight because it's a constant motion. Yep, we have to talk to you about that right now. This got a release arm on it. Here's the giveaway. You see a chain on your fire escape on the cantilever. Let me explain how that chain got there. It's basically, if I get to a fire escape, and I'm going to talk specifically about cantilevers, 
in, um, you get to a fire escape and if the cantilever was pointing up to the sky, would you write a violation? That means it's out of balance. The wake block got filled with water, grew, and, and basically the cantilever started doing this. And then it pointed to the sky. And I didn't want a violation from you, so what did I do? I speak with my maintenance guy, I said, hey, what can we do here? <laughs> Let's go down to Home Depot and buy a piece of chain. And I'm going to tie a piece of chain on the tail over here and just tie it back to a structural point or just anything on the fire escape that's, that the, the chain will reach. Something, something that's within reach. So they'll tie it to a tread, they'll tie it to a rail bar, they'll tie it to the grating, they'll tie it. And now it's horizontal. And you're walking through your alleyway. You're going to write a violation? No, well, I have to say, because you didn't know what the chain was for. You thought it was part of the part of the requirement. It's not. A chain is what they use, because as soon as you cut that chain, you know what that cantilever does? Now, somebody needs to get down that fire escape. How many treads do they walk out? Two, four, six, eight, before their weight counter counteracts? So, this is a properly functioning fire escape. And you're talking about one that has no release arm. What the norm is, when snow comes and pigeons land on it, does it drop? Yes. A properly weighted fire escape without no release arm, you're supposed to come here, step on the first tread, activate it, it is so perfectly balanced like a Swiss watch that when you step on it, it starts dropping two to three feet per second, hits the ground and stays down, and then you self-evacuate. And when the firemen arrive, they use the same fire escape to get into the building if they need it. That's how it's supposed to be. But, yeah, well, that's a, it's a Swiss watch. That's a Swiss watch. It doesn't work, but, you know, it's a Swiss watch. But again, like you said, snow, pigeons landing on the end, what happens? So at 3 o'clock in the morning, the can is down, who do you call? The, le the tenant calls the landlord and says, hey, somebody's breaking into the building because the can is down. So the, the landlord, to avoid having to go there at 3 in the morning to put this can leavers up, did what? You put weight on the back, put a chain on it, and now it's always up in the air. So even if it goes down for whatever reason, tenant leaving by, you know, in the middle of the night or whatever, it goes up by itself. Is it illegal? No. So if you see any change on cantilevers, that's somebody who's modified it and it's weighted backwards. So now let's talk about what these release arms are supposed to be for. Single action requiring no special knowledge. I've got a woman that's basically egressing a fire. She's got a child with her. Do you drag a child or you put the child in front of you? In front. So this 150 pound woman takes this 50 pound child and they stop walking down the fire escape and they get to this part. Okay. Now, let's take away the cantilever, and it's got a chain, I mean the release arm, there's a chain here, and the woman basically goes down the stairs with the child in front. Actually, will she, can she manage the child like that, or is she gonna get in front of the child? Actually, she's gonna get in front of the child, right? Because she, this is new to her, right? Does she send the child first, or is she gonna go first? So she switches it around and says, let me go. And so she starts walking down the stairs, and then she gingerly steps on the first step, and what happens? It's weighted backwards. Goes three steps out, what happens? Five steps out, what happens? So that's moving a little bit, right? A couple more steps, and that thing starts coming down five to ten feet per second. Hits the ground, slams the ground, and does what to her? And the child. But she held on, screaming and yelling, right? Because she just, you know, she fell backwards. She, she held on, she grabbed the child. Everybody's crying and screaming now. And so she gets out to the ground, and she gets off at the last tread that's down because it's on the ground and she steps off with her 150 pounds and does what? The child is still behind us. All of a sudden this child gets sent 12 feet in the air. What happens to the child? The child holds on. You guys are all going to the side, side of this one. So the child is now 12 feet up in the air, screaming and crying. The mom's down below in her nightgown telling the child to do what? Does the child jump 12 feet? So the fireman comes running down the, the alleyway Right, because the mother is running up the alleyway to do what? Get back in the building. She has the keys with her? <laughs> so she's trying to get back into the fire to basically say, who? Okay. So as she's running back to get in the front of the building, the fireman shows up, what's going on? She says, oh, my child. The fireman runs down the alleyway with her and says, hey. So the kid tells the kid to do what? The kid does what? No. no. So the fireman runs back. So the precious minutes are cooking right now. The fireman runs back and gets his pipe pole. Does what? Pulls it, brings it down, steps on it, gets the child reunited with the mother. Then what happens? 
So he stays there holding it, because the other fire are all coming in, they all want to use the fire escape. If he lets go of this, where's it go? So that's not the way these fire escapes were built. And in Massachusetts, they all have release arms. Majority of them all have release arms. The way it's supposed to work, she arrives here with a child, releases it, single action, requiring no special knowledge, or just she pushes it out of her way. She can run through it, even if she doesn't see it. It'll pivot and re rotate down here, and it rotates away from the cantilever. Cantilever weighs 25 pounds on the nose, because it's perfectly balanced now. And as soon as you release it, what happens to it? Goes down by itself, hits the ground, stays down. She hasn't even reached the pivot point yet, and where is it already? She goes down, self evacuates. The firemen show up there one minute, ten minutes, or one hour later. What do they have at their disposal? Full set of stairs, if they want to use it. That's how release arms work. If you see a chain, it's an indication that's one of them. Here's one with no release arm, and what's happening to it? It's already through weight or through improper whatever, it's already out of balance. And that's how these get smashed. Here's a release arm open, yet, and there's the chain. See the chain? So as soon as you see a chain, somebody has modified it. That's a violation <coughs> of the fire code and the building code, because the can leave is out of balance. Smashes in, 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 from trucks. Smashes from trucks. Smashes. When they get out of balance, the trucks always clip them. All cantilevers are usually 12 to 14 feet off the ground. And the reason being? Trucks. <coughs> staircases. You're going to love this one, right? The, the staircases have the clips, the string clips that hold all those stairs. Sometimes the string clips are all shot. So entire staircases are ready to drop to the ground. This is a 24 story hotel in Chicago. This is a shot from the ground of one of the staircases. That was certified. What? One inch of rust, how many years? Treads from the ground, you look up, you start seeing treads, this is a life safety issue. When, when should they have written the, the violation? When the first tread fell or when the eighth tread started falling? By itself under a snow load. Cars backing in, trucks backing in. Trees, Trees falling. <coughs> rails, when rails sit right on top of the sea channels, they create a pocket that debris and rust and, and growth and they start tearing apart the sea channels. Threads. The spacers, see, they rot inside. I can't fix those spacers. Can I get another another five years out of this piece of grading? Yes. If I can put a piece of flat on top, a piece of flat on the bottom, and then every six inches or so there's a bolt, a carriage bolt, top head, and I basically squish to create a sandwich. Will I guarantee this back to the client? No. You've got a pre existing structure, but I can reinforce it so that it doesn't separate. But we should replace all your grading and all your treads that have these spacers inside with a new style of grading. It doesn't have any of these spacers. Uh, they look like inside when they're running on it. See, so the rotted tops. Very difficult to fix. It's cheaper to replace. Can't weld them, right? The lead log won't let me weld them back at the shop either. I know a lot of guys are going to take them back to the shop and weld them. <laughs> you know, that's supposed to. 50 years of rust on the trip. And then some of these are schools. This is a school in New Jersey for elementary school. And that was near the shore, so you can imagine. Look at all the rust. I mean, how many inspections pulled by fire prevention and building department does it take for them not to see this much rust growth? Ladders. Ladders are a big issue, not only for the roof ladders, but the uh, these are the different types of ladders that are, this is West Coast ladders, a lot of them are three sliding ladders. Cording ladders. The reason why they can have those is because they don't have any freeze issues. Otherwise, if you've got snow and ice on this thing, it'll lock this baby up. But over there, they basically, you release that, and that thing just expands like an accordion. And it's a ladder that you go down, and they'll go 25 feet with that thing. That's how you get to the sidewalks in a lot of the buildings in LA. Ladders on the side, fixed ladders. 
miles of wave system, so they got to drop two to three feet per second to hit the ground and stay down. Roof ladders, a lot of times they brought out here. Firemen are the only ones testing this, but under that rule where you inspect it every year, management has to climb up and over these things to basically assure the firemen that the firescape is in good order. This is something that's been, uh, that we've seen a lot down in Jersey, and it's called a modified ladder, where they actually cut the ladder and they created a flop out. It's called a flop out ladder, which is illegal because as that thing swings out, what happens if you're underneath it when it's going through its full swing? It'll hammer you on the head and kill you. So these are illegal. This is somebody that didn't want to put in a weight or didn't want to put in a fold out ladder. And so because of that, they basically created something. There's a chain usually at the very top that you have to slowly let out as it does its loop. And no child, no old lady can handle those things. So basically, it's a, it's a modification because everybody was breaking in to the building. So we get these, you say it's illegal, you have to permanently affix it. And there's a lot of times when you can affix it and you can jump seven feet off the ground. So seven to nine feet can be uh, a distance that you, the last run is seven to nine feet off the ground. Again, we would speak with the city official on that, which what they allow, otherwise they can do it permanently to the ground or put weights on it so it drops to the ground or they can also have a fold out ladder. It looks like a drain pipe when it's closed and then you hit it and it opens into a, what's called an expanding ladder. I think there's one at the Sun Building, an aluminum one. They took the cantilever out at the very bottom and they put this aluminum hole there. That's actually an aluminum ladder. Yeah, but so it's got a like padlock set. on it so it doesn't uh, unlock. Right, but that's basically somebody, and you can't do that. You can't take a staircase and put a ladder at the very end. You can't downsize the system. You can only increase the system. So by taking a staircase and putting it on a drop ladder, it's an illegal. That, that had gotten hit by all the trucks over the years, so they tore right. out. That's not right. So, this is the, uh, I'm going to show you what, what happens with the violence of a cantilever being dropped. Chicago. This is a company using it, using this fire escape as a working platform. Can a masonry restoration company use a fire escape as a platform, a working platform? There's a release mechanism right here. These trucks are usually 12 to 14 feet tall. Look how close they get to this fire escape. Now, if that wasn't balancing, for some reason the wind had blown it down a little bit, yeah. that guy can't see that, and he would have clipped that thing and dragged it to the ground. On this one, you'll notice the chain. So one is properly balanced, the other one has been modified by the, the, the owner of the hotel that would be hit by trucks. So what we're talking about now is now we're going to open it up and start getting some questions to you guys as to you know what can be done at the, at the city level. If you look on the back of your book, towards the very end of the, of the last page, there's the steps. So as you can see, the first set that you want to do is you want to implement the Department of Procedures and Guidelines. So if you want to use some of the information on here, copy and paste it. Katie can send you the information on the Word document and just put it on your own city document. So, so you don't have to use this, but they make this for you. But basically create procedures and guidelines for everybody who's going to come into your city. So if you're an engineer, here's how, how we'd like you to kind of do it. If you're a repair guy, we'd like you to do it, but you always got to get a permit and you always have to have some engineer watching you. That's all it says. And if you're going to paint it and you're also the repair guy, just make sure you're licensed with the renovator's license to, to at least make sure you're not going to contaminate it. Okay. The, uh, the confidence test is the second thing you know that Bob has is an industry standard confidence test, which is basically a final exam 
for a structural engineer. And there's specific questions. There's no opinion questions in there. There's like, is there any rust in any of the connections? And how have you verified the connection into the wall? So that confidence test is going to tell you, and are you providing me with an opinion? Or are we going to load test this upon completion? Or are we going for a certification on this one, which is a full refurb of every connection? And all the welded connections are going to get rebolted so we don't have to x-ray this, this baby in the future. Because that's the only thing that we know we, we have to throw in this is that the welded connection must be load tested every five years. But as soon as you bolt it, then it falls right into what the rest of the structure is. It's a bolted connection fire escape. So we're not telling, we're not telling you to cut the weld, we're telling you that the welds that are there need a bolt through it to basically eliminate it as a need for either radiographing or mode testing. Okay? The last thing we have there is the, uh, not the last, but the, the preliminary and final affidavits. Well, it's already standard for all your commercial stuff, isn't it? Am I wrong? Does anybody want to contradict that to say that the, the construction control document, which is a mass document, is required on all commercial activity anyway, over 35,000, right? So all we've done is basically use that document, put in the language that is the mass code into the document and say, hey, you know, otherwise, do you even need this document uh, with, with the language in it? Can you just use any standard, you know, preliminary affidavit documentation and final affidavit documentation that the state already provides you? Is there a level of detail that's required on the affidavits? In other words, do they have to be as specific as stair tray three, level four, tested, no tested, approved? No, you're going to get a report back from you. You're talking about in the examination. The examination you get back is one of two uh, from, a, from a structural engineer who does a preliminary. When you read the confidence test, it's just yes, no. But it says submit a report on your letterhead that includes photographs. So there's a detail that comes from the, the engineer who inspected the fire escape. Because it's that detail that's going to come to you in one of two ways. One is that you have, because um, you can't issue a permit. The city won't let you, let you issue a permit without some sort of report that says, what are we going to do here? So an engineer and or an architect can do one of two things, and it stays right on the confidence test. You can draw the whole fire escape at great expense, and then put a little arrow saying, fix this bolt, fix that bolt. And that's a huge expense for the client. Or, because a lot of the guys who fix these fire escapes are blue collar guys, you walk through the fire escape with a can of paint and the engineer basically spot, spot paints it for dummies. He goes, photograph, photograph, photograph. That's it. That is what gets submitted to the city official. And they sit down at a desk and say, hey, these are all the things that I found. Uh, vendor XYZ is going to come in here and pull a permit, and he's going to fix these things. Because the client has chosen to spot repair everything I've identified here. And then we're going to proceed to a low test. Or, um, here's some photographs, and basically, we're going to change every bolt out. And I've already got three scheduled visits that I'm being paid for to basically watch this vendor you know, change all these bolts to avoid the load test. And then at the end, when the confidence test is issued as a final affidavit, um, the city official still got to go there and do his final to close the permit. So sometimes a city official will go out and find something that the building's the uh, engineer missed. So there's sort of a double check that occurs, which was never occurring in 75 years. So what gets, what removes the violation is not the permit sign-off. What removes the violation is the issuing of the confidence test to the city official by the structural engineer that the fire escape has been certified or has been load tested. And a lot of times in your repairs, depending on how complex it is, you want to do all your repairs and you want to spot prime all your repairs and you don't allow painting of the structure until um, all, everything gets examined by the structural engineer and the city official, depending on the complexity. So sometimes you won't let them close, like, don't let, I, I won't let you close the walls until I come and check it out. You know what I'm saying? So you don't let them paint or silicone shut the connections um, until you verify that uh, you know, all the rust has gone out. So sometimes you walk up to a fire escape that's full of brown spots, and it's, those are all the prime repairs. This is a, you know, we we've trained and, and, and so a lot of these classes are from, as you can see, Washington, D.C., where we trained about almost 50 inspectors who in that year only wrote two violations. Why? Because they, a lot of times they say, we can't write a violation because we don't know how to answer it. You know, we don't know what to tell these people short of, you know, just get it painted. <coughs> and that's what happened. That was the, pretty much what occurred in, in the United States is that 
the maintenance thing started 75 years ago, and it carries, it was vendor driven, not the pull permit. We keep calling it maintenance and painting, and basically it, it got us what we have here today. The engineers weren't making any money on it because they could not do any proper oversight, so they were basically shot out of the box. So that's why when I mentioned in Boston, if you have a G3 license and you repair fire escapes, you think any engineers really making any money in Boston? Because it's, they were driven out of the market. But now if you make it so that, you know, the fire escape must be have, must have engineer oversight, because it says anything that's commercial, it's going to require these preliminary and final affidavits. It's not happening in every city. So some cities are model cities, and then some cities host other cities to basically get the, the areas to start. But it's slow. It's like, you know, slow burning grass. It's going to take a while for it to catch. But, you know, we've taught all the four associations in Massachusetts. Uh, but not necessarily does everybody embrace it. They got too much on their plate. They've got other issues on their plate. Uh, and sometimes fire escapes is the last thing. So we've done the housing authority here. What's it called? The, the housing authority there? The uh, uh, He looks like one of the guys here from the, uh, but this is uh, over there in Chinatown. Uh, MBHP. Well, that's Chinatown. Metro, no, Metro, Metro, uh, Metro uh, Bus and Housing Partnership. That's that's, that's what we've done there. So we've done classes, walked around. This is with us walking them all around. So we've done housing, we've done facilities management training, we've done building inspector training, uh, fire prevention training. So, um, and again, all these codes basically, the one thing that really helped us out was when we finally got in training everybody, we started realizing that everybody had a base of fire code, NFPA, or international building code. And what we found is that they all said the same thing. We just explained it in these classes that you guys. Everybody in the maintenance or, or, or keeping of a building safe, they basically all say the same thing. The authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other than evidence of strength. And the confidence test was one of the key pieces. It basically made everybody start not using the opinion letters anymore. And these departmental procedures and guidelines basically took away the, you know, the, the use of some certificates that have that clause that says to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, fire escape is in, you know, conformity with 1001.3, which is just an opinion. So confidence tests are, it gets everybody's information. You need a preliminary confidence test. You need a final confidence test. You need a preliminary affidavit. You need a final affidavit. And it just basically starts putting some responsibility and then you have the, the, the one year examination. So if you're examining the apartments or you're examining the commercial buildings once a year, you should get one of these every year. It's a nice reminder to the building owner that there's a five year rule. Put a certificate on that fire escape, put a tag on that fire escape. We talked about all the uh, things. This is the local letter that they sent out with the tent records. And all that did was tell everybody hey, if you own a building in, in the city and it has a fire escape, be aware that there's a five year rule. So you may want to copy this, and he sent copies around. So you can basically have your your uh, building department send this out to known fire escape buildings, or to basically as part of the tax record, and this will make everybody aware. And some people not only own buildings in your city, they own buildings in other cities, and this makes them aware that in these other cities they need to fix those fire escapes also. Because 1001.3 is general enough to say uh, all types of exterior means of egress. Should the letter also say that, or should it really relegate itself only to exterior fire escapes? Well, it's the letter that we have says fire escapes and similar structures, which is okay. tied back into the language. Well, I'm speaking of thinking macro for the other municipalities that are represented here. What's your opinion that it should encompass the full language of 101.3? Or I'll say it's a can of worms, and I think you should uh, you should put the code let put the whole code in there but primarily only focus right now on fire escapes. Let that be the driving force of why you're talking to people, because that's a life safety issue. And then let it expand in the next three to five years into decks, balconies, bridges, and such. All right, you asked me a question. Uh, yeah. This is in Jersey City. Yeah. Not Jersey City, I'm sorry. Elizabeth, New Jersey. This is a 12-story slide scape. Imagine that. It starts, they, we're on the roof with the Elizabeth Fire Department, and every floor has these two little doors. And you're supposed to open them at every floor because it only has one staircase. And you're supposed, when you open the doors, jump and you're allowed a potato sack. 
head first or not, into this dark abyss. So this is a photograph <laughs> with a flash. Because as soon as you open that, there's no lights in there. And there's 12 people jumping into the same thing. So as you're coming down, there's some other guy saying, hey, it's my turn. And you go down 12 stories. You hit the last floor, and then you take a quick left turn. You go straight for 45 degrees. And you hit this metal door with a paddle that your feet are supposed to whack it and flip over this paddle. Or your head hits the paddle and flips over this metal iron door. When we got there, the door wasn't working. They had to send a fireman down with a flash can and you know they're holding them, pulling them up, holding them up with a rope to basically go down and basically kick the door open. This is the only slide skip. Uh, this is a um, what they call a um, Art Deco building, built in the 1900s, 1905. The floor is all metal. All it's all uh, riveted, um, uh, um, you know, duck, ducking. It's all one way. So as you go down, you basically hit all the little bumps, but they're all, you know, pretty much at uh, in all all screws. So every so often there's a there's a seam full of, full of rivets, all the way down. Twelve stories. <laughs> and it's a one-way system. You go down, but you can't get up. Okay. So the industry standards that we're talking about about lead, about the OSHA. You know what I'm saying? So what I'd like to do is take another small little break, and let's see if anybody wants to see if there's any last-minute donuts over there, and let's open it up now to the questions that you may have related to things that are in the book, questions about what you want to do with your city. So let's take a little ten-minute break, and uh, if anybody has any questions, see if there's any coffee left. I don't think so. I think the construction 
I don't know what you can get the credit for, but whatever the building inspectors or fire officials need CEU credits for that the state would basically sanction, that's what we're, we're up. How and what license they apply, I think that they are able to be used for construction supervisor's license. I think that's a whole different, uh, I think that's 10 out of that. I have the same <laughs> Well, Ken Spencer is the one that will tell you whether or not. Uh, Kate, uh, Ken Spencer? Oh, yeah, Kate, uh, Kate will know what the number is because uh, Ken Spencer was giving this a course number. Uh, and, but that's going to be on the form anyway, so when we submit. Uh, not, we don't submit this. Bob submits this through. Oh, uh, okay. So we're not the one that. Uh, but we're in touch with Ken Spencer. She's the one that's telling us because we're now creating four hour classes, two hour classes, and even one hour classes.